Anyway, uh, what is very difficult today is that I'm very worried that whatever promises government gives to the rebel uh, groups, difficult to fulfill is what I see because of the character of the government today. Uh, you know, based on experience, when a government does not seem to be uh, focused or organized, uh, it's difficult to have anything implemented. So I, I do not see any any serious coordination in the various units and organs of government today, and that's very very difficult. Uh, it is not enough that you have a president who says I give this, I give that, I give that. You know the bureaucracy of government is so strong that you just can't make promises without making sure that you have complete control of the organs of government. So to me. That's the biggest danger. And I think this is already <coughs> being felt, uh, especially in the area of peace. I think the, the uh, MILF, while it is continuing to discuss with government, has some questions behind their, their heads. Matutuloy ba? O hindi matutuloy? Totoo na ba to? O hindi ba totoo? You know, these are deep social questions. And you have an MILF that is in the means of reorganizing itself, you know. Uh, they just elected a new chairman, si Yusuf Jikiri, who used to head the Pangsamora Army. Yeah, Jikiri is now the new chair. Uh, no, 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 that's, this is MNLF. MNLF. So uh, I think they're in the period of uh, reorganizing themselves. And, and if you can see the choice of new leader, former chief of staff of the Bansamoro Army. So their emphasis really is how do they consolidate their, their bargaining leverage, which is essentially armed. So, and, and he is Tausu. So that's, that's an important matter to, to consider. See, Nobiswari belongs to another, another year. I had very, very close working relations with him during the exile years. So I know more or less how he, he behaves. But you see that most of the people surrounding Normiswari are no longer MNLF. These are, the, we call them, uh, you know, during the time of Corey, we call them Pats 86, 1986, meaning they only joined after the revolution. So, yan ang mga mostly the character of people of Normis Wari. So I don't know whether he would carry uh, sufficient influence when he would talk of the Muslim community. However, uh, he has he has quite a sizable armed group with him. So he could still create trouble if he wants to. In, in the case of the uh, MILF, uh, they have been dependent on Malaysian support and guidance. Uh, there's something a bit, uh, how would I say this? Because, you know, the, the, I wish they continued with the, the third party facilitator that was originally appointed by the chief, now see Dr. Uh, he, he was former head of the intelligence service of Malaysia, but he knows the situation very, very well. But he was rejected by some elements in the government, I don't know why. In fact, they're suspecting that he was rejected because he was a friend. He is a friend. But he should have been the ideal third party facilitator because he is the one who guided the MNLF during the underground years. Anyway, the new facilitator, I, I don't know him. But, uh, I think the MILF is forced to continue with the negotiations because they have spent so much years and time. So, uh, but they, the, as I said earlier, they have questions in their mind whether government can fulfill. Kasi pati itong uh, transitional, uh, what do you call this? Yung kanila bagong 
agreement. I know it's unconstitutional. The Transition Council is unconstitutional. It will require uh, constitutional changes to be made. tends to encourage this kind of political climate in the Philippines. Wherein there is uh, in the you're not sure of your future. You are not sure whether your rights will be protected, so you tend to be on the extremist side. And also, because the president keeps on saying that he is not very happy being president, he keeps on saying that he might be leaving the presidency sooner than mandated. And then you have this, this uh, continuing uh, chismis that he is ill. Therefore, there is a question to the uh, stability of the office of the presidency. And because of this, it is really encouraging groups to think in terms of who will take over after. The most dominant uh, aggravation that I know will be the uh, CPP and PNDF. <coughs> you know that, uh, you know that uh, the cabinet secretary, supposed to be the most influential cabinet member, is John Basco, Secretary John Basco. He is now the number two in the National Democratic Front. He's vice chairman of the National Democratic Party. Fidel Akawil is the chair, he's the vice chair. So he represents the, the interests of the NDF. He's currently the vice chairman. In fact, if you, if you will care to review you my statements, press conferences ng President, ay kasama siya. The, the president is even saying, I want an NDF to say, Pinasa ko kong June. You know, this is, this is we, where, where, where we are today. You know? And uh, I think it's being questioned in Manila the way the powers of the Office of the Executive Secretary has been practically transferred to Judy Basco, you know, a cabinet secretary during my time and during the times of other presidents is an insignificant position in terms of the palace. Cabinet secretary lang yun. Inintindihan lang is make sure that cabinet meetings are in order. That the agenda of the cabinet meeting are, you know. Pero ngayon, Judy Basco was granted all the powers that should have been with the executive secretary. He controls more than 12 very important offices of the office of the president that is directly concerned actually with what government should do with the poor, with the people. Yun ang kanya. So, Lisa Masa heads the uh, Anti-Poverty Commission. Well, uh, I don't know his first name, I forgot. He's head of the NAPSI. PCUP. You, you can see. That is why, you, if you notice now, the effort of Kadamay. Kadamay has taken over one, one uh, housing project ang nagpapakain ang DSWD, ang nagbibigay, <laughs> you know, uh, that's completely communist. Yung mga nasa opisina ng PDK. That's why Katamay is not being treated like that. You know, this is, uh, these are serious developments. But what is alarming for Mindanao is that we are monitoring the, uh, the coming in of representatives from the high rank by the officers of the New People's Army. Mukhang, Mukhang New People's Army behaves differently from the CPP. For example, when, when there's an ambush here in Davao del Sur recently, sabi ng ni Pidel Agawi ng NDF, CPP-NDF, 
Baka naman hindi NPA na. But then the NPA two days later said, no, come here. You know, and uh, we are particular about the, 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 the kind of ambush that is being conducted by the NPA today. It's, you know, suwabi kung mag-ambush ang NPA two na. You know, they tried their best to, to, to show that they are better than the armed forces of the Philippines. But the way that ambush was conducted is, is kind of brutal, you know, compared to the standard operating procedure of the New People's Army People Are. Uh, that's one item. The other disturbing phenomenon is that we know for a fact that uh, representatives from the New People's Army are now in uh, constant communication with the multi group, with the mga extremist groups among Muslims, and they're offering weapons. And we don't know why. Although the last time that I went abroad and talked to some of my counterparts in the region, they are also noticing a revival of, yung mga, you know, communist movements in, uh, in other Asian countries are rather small, you know, almost negligible. But there seems to be a revival. And they're doing the same thing that the NPA is doing in the Philippines, offering weapons to extremist Muslim groups in the ASEAN region. Iba na ngayon eh, nagbibigay na ng armas. Of course, we are monitoring in Central Luzon. The Juanito, eh, a regular coming in of weapons, uh, especially in the area surrounding the Metro Manila. <coughs> so, may parang parang nabuhay yung yung New People's Army again. Uh, in the ang intensity is not you know on a level that is quite alarming. Unless we want to be communist as a country, then we should welcome it. Ang problema kasi, you know, during, during our time in the negotiations, when I, when I, uh, when President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo took over as president, I immediately looked into the agenda of the peace talks. The agenda, the end game of the agenda of the pistol, to my mind, is coalition governance. But, but during that time, Sila Fidel, si John Mancison, coalition governance to them is something that is so secret you should not mention it. But I said, if this is how the pistol is, you know, is going to be conducted, the end game of this is, is coalition government. And I don't know whether government during my time is prepared to establish a coalition government with the communists. So, to the point that I recommended changing the agenda of the peace talks which led to the breakdown of the talks during my time. Kasi, hindi naman nila sinasabi na gusto nila ng coalition. I said, if it's coalition governance, then government has to meet and really evaluate this whether we are prepared to enter into coalition government with the communists. In the case of the government of Pinoy, I think coalition government as an end game became visible. Medyo nag-o-open na yung gobyerno sa coalition government. And then I think some elements of the armed forces objected to it. That's why there's also a breakdown of talks during the time of President Pinoy. Now, uh, hindi ba nagsisimula ang talks? Nag-appoint na si President Duterte ng major communist in the cabinet. In effect, already establishing a coalition government with the communists, even before the talks. This is what happened. Ngayon, ang naging problema, because of what happened, this is the danger, I think, in the revival of the talks. I don't think if we know the character of the communists, I do not think the communists will accept less than what they already have. Right, right now, virtually, the communists
bodies are in collision already in the government today. Kaya kung mag may negotiation pa, what will they demand actually? It's something more than coalition governments. In fact, what we are sensing is that for the first time in the long history of communist struggle in the Philippines, they are now very optimistic that they can actually take over government itself. Ang malaking problema kasi natin sa coalition government with the communists is that I do not think that those in government today are thinking of helping the president govern. I think what they are doing today is really sabotaging government. Because what they want is for this particular system of governance to fail. What they want is their own brand of governance. For example, in agrarian reform, Paeng Mariano is the DAR secretary. You know that today, government has two policy on agrarian reform. One policy is the one approved by Congress. The other policy is what the NDA approves of. And I think you will see the effect of this very soon. Kadama is starting their own policy of housing. You know, the policy of the NDF on housing is if there's anything vacant there, those who do not have homes have the right to occupy them. In the case of land, so an agrarian reform of communists is that if there's vacant land there, those who do not have land have the right to occupy it. So it's going to happen. That's why we should be warning may laki-laki lupa ng konti dyan. Pag nakainitan yan ng tropa ng komunista, i-occupy yan, and you will see government defending them. As is happening now with the takeover of housing units that are not yet occupied by their beneficiaries. So this is, this is going to escalate, I believe. What I uh, am worried about is Mindanao. Mindanao will be in trouble. They, akala ko ang trouble will be Manila. Because yung, you know, it's not being uh, implemented here extensively. You know, but the, the Kilusang Pagbabago and Masa Masin program of the DILG is extensively being up, uh, implemented in the national capital region, especially among the poorer communities. Ang uh, kilusang pagbabago up to now, well, uh, the latest that they're doing is what you call uh, uh, community profiling. They're profiling who, who could be for them, or with them, or those who will not be. And then Masa Masid is an intelligence community-based intelligence outfit being supported by the DILG. So this is very, 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 very extensive in the communities in the national capital region. I don't sense the same intensity here in Mindanao. Seems that hindi masyadong in implement but national capital region, very extensive. In fact, the barangay captains there have to implement it because, you know, the uh, election of barangay captains have been suspended. If you do not perform according to the wishes of the DILG, you may lose your job. Uh, somebody else can be appointed. That is why there is fear among the barangay captains of the national capital region. Some of them are being killed right now. The killings that uh, uh, some of us are trying to monitor concentrate sa national capital region. I remember, you know, you see uh, <clears throat> the NTC have access to organized masses in the 
urban areas also of the national capital region. The first time we called for a meeting of the leaders of our urban poor communities, they're happy about Tokang. They're happy because suddenly, suddenly we're not afraid anymore to come home at night. Those who are working in the uh, last shift of the restaurants, the department store, they say that they can home in peace. Then later on, second, second round of meetings, there is fear in the communities. They see, they see how homes, you know, may bayad kasi ang bawat napapatay. They have, the police is paid per killing. And may commission sa punerarya. May commission sa punerarya. That's why, ang police. That is why, yung, yung pagkukunin mo yung body, uh, tumataas hanggang from 40 to 80,000 pesos per body. Kasi sasabihin, and the punerary, it's very obvious eh. Kasi saan na po kayo? Kasi ganito yung ibibigay namin sa polis eh. Now this, is, this has become very rampant in the national capital region. That is why so many killings. And then, yung sinasabi na palit ulo, actually hindi naman talaga ganun eh. Kaya lang, ayaw ng mga nangriring na pag pumasok sila sa isang bahay. Tapos wala doon. Baba eh, di walang pera. Kung anong nga doon, pinaparil na rin lahat. There are many innocent killings now. Right now. And I thought, for a while it was suspended that ngayon is yun. That is why in the report of our uh, urban poor organizers and communities, this is what is very disturbing. He said, yung mga pinatali, ito yung mga supplier ba ng yung uh, who will buy a little of the drug and then put them in small sachet. This is intended for taxi drivers, uh, tricycle drivers, those whose, whose, whose uh, work is 24 hours. So they, they need to stay awake. So it has become a necessity for work. And these are the people, yung mga napapatay, ito yung mga nagtitingiti, you know? So yun ang mga pinapatay. So what happened? Now people in Metro Manila, especially in the border of China, what has been achieved is actually elimination of competition. Itong mga nag uh, freelancers have been eliminated. Tuloy pa rin ang droga, except that the price is higher. And that the control now is coming from the syndicates. The original syndicates are the ones. So actually, we cleaned up yung mga nag-freelancer. Balik sa dating supplier and higher price. So, and this is, this is being reported by barangay officials. This is, this is not a uh, person. <clears throat> this is not a And because of my job before, people are still reporting sometimes to me. These are, these are very reliable information that we're gathering from the communities in Metro Manila. I don't know if it's happening in Davao City. Now and then, I raise questions like, tandaan niyo in Ambos na Vice Mayor, na Muslim, you remember? What is the story behind? Namuhan ng drugs sa Davao. Ibig sabihin, may droga pa sa Tabo hanggang ngayon. I thought there's no more drugs in Tabo. But very disturbing ang drug industry of Tabo. Protected. Your drug industry is protected in this city. That's as much as I can say. But, but, uh, this, this, these are very disturbing developments, but uh, ang, ang worry ko is that uh, next, the, the combination of, of uh, events in Davao, uh, I mean in Mindanao, might cause Mindanao to explode. The drug industry is not stuck in Mindanao. Mindanao. Then the, the, the passing on of weapons to extremist groups, especially the, the Muslims, 
This, I can say 100% accurate information because I know the personalities involved in the delivery of these weapons. So, mag-ingat kayo sa Mindanao. Especially those who are tumingga. Uh, yesterday, we were talking to about 35 Muslim religious leaders. We were telling them that, you know, the role of the religious community has never been this important in Mindanao. You see, during the previous governments, the role of religious leaders have been have been recognized by government. Now we have the Bishop Lano Conference. And uh, sila, sila Monsignor Pimpa, nagbuo pa ng conference na mga pari, you know? And then the, the, the mga ulama. So that, that was very active in Mindanao, the role of uh, religious leaders. Because what is very important in the conflict with Muslim is to make sure, to make sure that there's any fighting the fighting should not be interpreted as a form of religious war. If there's fighting, you can say between MNLF and government, between MILF and government, between Abusak and government, but never between Christians and Muslims. The moment it becomes like that, then we are really in deep trouble. And I think the Bishop Ulama Conference before have succeeded in making sure that the armed conflict in Mindanao does not become a religious country.